You're listening to a podcast from the South China Morning Post. The United States is going to do our part. America is back at the table. In an age of global competition, Europe and North America must stand strong together in NATO to defend our values and our interests, especially at a time when authoritarian regimes like Russia and China challenge the rules-based um, international so as, order. Um, an enormous, la- the largest economic power as G7, it is for us important to convince our partners with us the investment comes without strings and attachment compared to China. You just heard China's foreign ministry representative, Zhao Linjian, and the translation of what he's saying is, China is strongly dissatisfied with and firmly opposed to it, which was part of his remarks about the G7, but could well sum up much of what Beijing's response was to Biden's whirlwind five-day series of meetings with the G7, NATO, and the European Union. Welcome to the China Geopolitics Podcast. I'm Chad Bray. We're spanning the globe this week as we recap U.S. President Joe Biden's barnstorming tour of Europe and Beijing's reaction as he tries to repair ties among America's allies. It's been a big week and there's a lot to review. China's at the center of all of it, but they weren't there. The G7 meeting was essentially about pushing back against China's growing influence. It was followed by strong statements about human rights and the security challenge of China by both the European Union and NATO. To cap it off, Biden met with Russian President Vladimir Putin in his first big international trip, and Beijing buzzed Taiwan airspace with more than two dozen warplanes. Joe Biden even unveiled an acronym that sounds more like a K-pop band, B3W. We'll discuss the Build Back Better World Plan. It's the West answer to the China's Belt and Road Initiative, as well as other developments this week. We'll be joined by Rob Delaney in Washington, as well as Zhoshin in Hong Kong. And of course, I'll be joined by Finbar Birmingham in Brussels. He'll give us the latest on the EU's renewed partnership with the U.S. Let's get on with the show. We're joined on the line from Washington by Rob Delaney, the North American Bureau Chief for the SCMP, as well as here in Hong Kong, political economy editor Joe Shin. Rob, let's start with you. I wanted to sort of go back to the G7 from last week, and Biden's had a whirlwind trip through Europe. Did he get what he came for? He really called for action rather than just lofty statements, but we frankly saw a lot of statements. There were a lot of statements, but the fact is that it's difficult to get this many countries to commit to anything that specific. And I think especially when you consider that there was a bit of prevarication from on the part of Germany, for example, and there were also, you also have economies like Japan, which are quite dependent on China. The fact that they were able to put China into their statement so specifically and so often, I think shows that Biden could claim that he moved the needle in terms of the stance and the posture towards China among these among these countries and within this group. Uh, Joshan, I wanted to turn to you. How is Beijing taking a look at this beyond just sort of the response that we sort of normally see that this is a Cold War mentality? This is an outdated way of thinking. What's really being said out there? Well, I think for Beijing, on the surface, of course, uh, they are very unhappy with this. They are very angry about this. They are seeing that the U.S. is imposing its agenda onto its allies, uh, including its uh, European and Asia uh, allies, and uh, to have kind of anti-China coalition. But I think behind these rhetorics from the foreign ministry and the state media, the real worry in Beijing should be not as much as it seems. Because for the Chinese government, history tells China that the Americans and Europeans are not always on the same page. I mean, they can agree on these values and the principles because nobody can say, no European country can say, no, I do not respect human rights, right? But if you ask specifically a European company to do something, say, give up China as a market, I think they will think twice. So for the Chinese government, there's misalignment in the interests between the U.S. and its European and Asian allies. So there are room for China to play or to minimize the impact. At the same time, I think China is also showing 
very strong stance against what's happening between Biden and uh, G7 leaders. For instance, yesterday, China has sent an unprecedented amount of airplanes across the middle line of the Taiwan Strait. And this is a clear show of willingness and determination and flexing its muscle, its power. You know, China will not be deterred by these kinds of words from G7 leaders. At the same time, we can also see reports why, you know, U.S. has sending its warships to South China Sea. China is also increasing its frequency or presence of its military power in these waters. They are clearly, Beijing is telling the Western world, saying, these are still the bottom lines. You know, you can test on it, you can challenge it, but Beijing is not going to back off. And Joshin, I want to ask, is there a particular issue that really is the biggest concern to folks in Beijing? Is it rewriting the rules on global trade? Is it renewing investigations into the beginnings of the coronavirus pandemic? Or is it just that we've got the U.S. after four years of Trump moving much closer to its European allies? Over the long run, Chad, I think that the concern is really like the U.S. is playing a leading role and uniting the European and Asia together, and they can form a united front against China. This is a, this is a strategic challenge. But yes, for the pressing issues, I think the investigation into the origin of COVID-19 will be a very big headache and a big concern for the Chinese government. Because for now, for China, it seems like the facts are already laid there. The lab leak theory has already been overthrown. And so if the U.S. is keeping asking others and China to do more research or to look into this theory, it's an already an act of trying to punish China or trying to you know, make China the criminal or make China accountable for the COVID-19 outbreak, which the Chinese government will never accept. So the more the U.S. is talking about this theory, the stronger China has to respond, saying, you know, this is absolutely nonsense. You know, we will never do this. So it's kind of interesting to see how this will develop because there are, for me, there are little room for the two sides to reconcile or make compromise on this. And Rob, I wanted to turn back to you. It's interesting that, you know, at the same time, Biden's been able to sort of turn European attention to what China has been doing in terms of the Belt and Road and is suggesting a, a version of that for the Western world to help growth in Africa, in Latin America, in the Indo-Pacific. And so you know, we know a lot about what China spent, but do we know how this is going to work between the Americans and the Europeans on this? Is this a new Marshall Plan for the rest of the world? I wouldn't characterize it as a new Marshall Plan, I th especially because Biden continues to stress the idea that this would be more along the lines of a, a public-private partnership kind of idea, where Washington would leverage its International Development Finance Corporation, for example, and also the U.S. ex-IM Bank. And these were two agencies that really were kind of left to die several years ago. And it wasn't until 2018, really right around the time that the trade war between the U.S. and China started, that they revived this agency. They strengthened it. They doubled its budget to $60 billion. Now, that doesn't quite add up. It's actually a fraction of the kind of spending that Beijing's been doing for the Belt and Road Initiative. But they also point out that the idea is that the U.S. government will provide a certain amount of funding for projects, but they will also provide, uh, for example, insurance for these projects. They will provide anal detailed analysis of these projects. So the idea for the, they're calling it Build Back Better World, so B. 3W plan would sort of be along the same lines. And anyway, that's how they sort of cast it. But, you know, keep in mind, it was only announced just this past weekend. We don't know what the details are going to be. We still don't know, is this just done for the purposes of, in order to make a strong statement at the G7, or are the uh, is the G7 going to follow through with this? We just don't know. And we do know that they do feel pressure, though, from China. For example, Belt and Road Initiative projects, a lot of the analysis tends to fall in Africa, but I think that's the reason why at G7 there was an announcement about 1 billion doses of vaccine. When you consider that China has been so strong in terms of donating vaccines to Latin America, all of the countries in Latin America, uh, that's been a real embarrassment for the U.S. administration because it's something on the order of half of the donations of vaccines overseas that China has put out has gone to Latin America. I think a statistic I saw, it's something on the order of only 1% that has gone from the U.S. 
to Latin America. And whereas a year ago, or there was a lot of skepticism about uh, China's role in the pandemic and the way that it emerged in China. And uh, certainly back in January, there's a lot of questions about the efficacy of Chinese vaccines. Nonetheless, just about all of the governments in Latin America, including Honduras, for example, which still maintains diplomatic relations with Taiwan, all of them are turning to China. So you can kind of see that there's a tremendous amount of pressure on the U.S. and among G7 to do something, to really get moving, to try and catch up with what Beijing has been doing. Uh, that's a very interesting point, uh, Rob, because you mentioned this Belt and uh, Road Initiative. Actually, this idea of China was coming after the former Obama administration flagged this idea of new Silk Road Initiative. And you know, by that time, it was trying to make Afghanistan it was a kind of a central role in Asia and the Euro-Asia trade. And I still remember at that time, you know, they also talking about how to build up roads and infrastructure to develop the region. But it all, all failed. So at that time, there is a project called PAPI, a gas pipeline. The idea is great. I mean, channeling the gas from Turkmenistan all the way through Afghanistan and Pakistan to India. You know, in India, is a, a booming economy, is a democracy, it needs gas. But it can never be implemented. It can never be realized. It remain a, a pipe dream. So it shows like the limitations of the idea and the, the situation on the ground. While China's Belt and Road, although there are no coherent implementation strategy, you know, China has this capacity of building up things. So when the Chinese government say we should encourage more Chinese companies go out and do this infrastructure, they can do it quite easily in Africa, you know, building up the bridges, the roads and the stadiums and the buildings. These are the advantages of Chinese companies. So even the G7 countries are now pledging saying we can build up a, a better world, whatever. So who will do the job? Who will actually do the job on the ground? One likely scenario is that Rich countries will start some infrastructure project, but actually they have to contract or subcontract it to Chinese companies, and then the Chinese companies has actually to do the job. This is a one likely scenario. Anyway, the point is the G7 countries have some kind of visions. Oh, Beijing is doing that. Why can't we also doing something? But if you look at a little bit deeper, I think China has certain uh, unique advantages and capabilities of doing these things that the rich countries may not have these days. I think it's a matter of assumptions. I, I think you're right about how efficient China can be in terms of getting these these projects going. And you hear the language coming out of the G7, particularly from President Biden, about their alternative is superior because it will include, they talk about transparency, they talk about good governance, they talk about how all of these projects will be very much in line with best practices in terms of their carbon footprints. And I think they're presenting this as though everyone is going to go for that over the efficiency and the speed at which the Chinese government can move. And I think it remains to be seen whether that those factors will really attract these countries that, you know, for which the G7 is, and Biden are, are vying for influence in. There was a lot of talk about soft power and B3W and those sorts of things. But at the same time, we had Biden sit down with NATO and, you know, really try to get the focus of the alliance partners on the South China Sea, on the Indo-Pacific. Now, Zhoshin, you mentioned, you know, a bit of China's reaction that they sent planes into Taiwanese airspace. I'm curious, what are you hearing, sort of what additional kind of reaction should we expect? In the coming weeks, China is going to celebrate its, the Communist Party is going to celebrate its uh, 100th anniversary. So there have two like implications. A, China has to be look strong. You know, China cannot back off. China cannot look weak, especially when the Western powers are having all these rhetorics. So China has to do something to show that China is still defending its bottom lines, its core interests, and China is not backing off. And the second implication is that China do not want any surprises. China do not want any big accidents or whatever, whether it's military or, or political. So at home, you know, 
the Chinese government is trying very hard to ensure that uh, there will be no big accident like the one in uh, Hubei, you know, the gas blast just to kill 25 people. Even it's it's accident, but still, like, the government will try to make sure that these kind of tragedies will be minimized. And beyond the Chinese borders, at the same time, the Chinese government will also trying to ensure that there will be no incidents or uncontrollable, unexpected incidents to destroy kind of this atmosphere of celebration. That's my take. It is interesting, you know, we're two weeks away from the founding anniversary, the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. But at the same time, we've got uh, Biden sitting down with Putin and, you know, it's really dominating the headlines today. And, you know, one of the big questions is, does this push China and Russia closer together? And I'll start with you, Joe Shen, and, and then I'll turn to you, Rob. What are we going to see here? Could we see those two superpowers coming closer together? Well, China and Russia has already been very close over the last couple of years. Although many people are saying how close really are China and Russia. Of course, the two governments are shows to be like on the same page, taking the same stance over many issues. But in you know, the private sector, especially the trade, you know, the people to people exchange are actually quite limited compared, you know, China's exchange with other countries like the United States. And still, there are lots of gossips or speculations saying whether this uh, grand triangle diplomacy will replay in the 21st century. In the 1970s, basically, the U.S. has come into China, and so that the U.S. and China are united together against the Soviet Union, which eventually contributed to the collapse of the Soviet Union. But now there are worries in China with it. The U.S. and Russia will team together against China. But this is still a remote possibility. I mean, this is just like a talk between the two leaders. I don't think at the end moment, China will not play, give it too much weight to the meeting. And also, as the reports have showed, to the best, it's just a you know, softening of the hostilities between Moscow and Washington. It's too early or too far to say that these uh, two powers coming together. So for China and Russia, I think, will largely business as usual. And Rob, are you hearing anything in Washington about these two adversaries being closer together? Well, I, I think Josine is exactly right about how remote the possibility is at this point that the U.S. and Russia would establish a very close relationship. Uh, what's really happening here is that no one in the Biden administration at this point really has any expectation that they would be able to cozy up to Russia to the point where they could use that as leverage against Beijing. Really, what they're doing with this summit meeting is, as one analyst was explaining to me, the Biden administration is dealing with so many problems at the moment. They're dealing with a, a very divided Congress. The pandemic has eased quite a lot in the U.S., but it's not over. And of course, there are so many outstanding issues that the U.S. has with China. All Biden is trying to do at this point is to manage the issues, the outstanding issues that it has with Russia. The cyber attacks, the encroachment into uh, Ukraine. Biden is trying to look Putin directly in the eye because he believes that if he has that opportunity to tell Putin exactly what the U.S. will not stand for, at least that could slow or undercut the motivation that Putin might have to continue to kind of antagonize the U.S. But certainly there's no intention at this point or there's no expectation with Biden that he would be able to leverage his some sort of newly refreshed, newly restored relationship with Russia in order to have more of a uh, bargaining chip in its dealings with Beijing. And one last question uh, for both of you, if either has an answer. Biden's done his version of Amtrak diplomacy, except via Air Force One, but he's not sat down with Xi. When could we see that? Anytime soon? Joshin, what do you think? Really, I have no answer to this question. But if anything would happen, it will be uh, later than expected. Because as I just said, you know, in the coming weeks, China's party will be the domestic saying celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party. And also one more interesting thing I, I would like to uh, highlight is that ever since the outbreak of COVID-19, in, especially the virus in Asia, so Beijing has been into a very cautious mode. You know, all these diplomatic occasions uh, when Wang Yi is meeting all these foreign counterparts. The places are no longer in Beijing. It's always uh, somewhere else. 
in China, and it's usually like 1,000 miles away from Beijing, you know, in Guizhou, in Fujian, in Guangxi. And it, you can see that this shows like how cautious Beijing is in kind of meeting a big foreign delegation. <laughs> so that's why, based upon this fact, I think the meeting would be a little bit later than expected. If I was to hazard a guess, I would say that we might see a meeting on the sidelines of G20, which is going to be held in Rome in October. I honestly don't see any chance of that happening before that time frame. It's quite interesting. We've got China preparing for a very big party. Joe Biden with a lot on his plate, even though the U.S. has its own party a, you know, a few days after China's. So uh, thanks for joining us this week, guys. We appreciate it. Look forward to talking to you next week and another big week coming up. As critical news stories emerging from China continue to shape lives and business around the world, the weekly SCMP Global Impact Newsletter brings you expert analyses and insights on the economics of COVID-19, society, technology, and the environment. Sign up to receive your weekly email at scmp.com slash newsletters. Finbar, thanks for joining us from Brussels. You might say what a difference an election makes. 18 months ago, the American president was slamming the European members of NATO for not paying enough protection money. But in the past two days, a new American president, Joe Biden, helped encourage the members of NATO not only to forget the previous guy, but to start focusing on Asia and the South China Sea for the first time in, oh, 60 years of NATO's existence. When you joined us last week, you left us with a distinct impression about, you know, a buzz that was around the halls of power in Brussels, you know, as Joe Biden was preparing to approach. And so is there a warm afterglow about Biden's trip or is there a bitter aftertaste now that he's moved on? Well, I I think certainly the um, the European Union is delighted that he's been here. You know, that they're they're glad they kept saying over the course of the last few days, they're, they're so glad to have America back. There was a wee bit of fawning going on. Ursula von der Leyen, the um, president of the European Commission, was talking about how honoured she was that Joe Biden had chosen Europe as their, his first overseas trip. If you think back to what Donald Trump's first trip was, it was Saudi Arabia. Um, so it does sort of show where the two uh, differ, uh, one of the one of the many ways. Um, I think if you ask the average person in the street, there may be a sense of relief that he's gone. Uh, the heart of the city was locked down yesterday. It was crawling with police and army vans, helicopters buzzing overhead. You know, the army were blocking roads and stopping everyone from getting too close. But I think generally the trip went largely as expected. Across the board, there was a focus on rebuilding alliances, uh, which is music to the ears of much of Europe. You know, the G7 was dominated by Biden language. It was all talking about building back better, which of course is a cornerstone of, of Joe Biden's domestic policy. Boris Johnson appropriated that for the G7. At NATO, there was a sense that the U.S. was back and it was committed, which is equally as important. Uh, Remember that Trump, as you said, Chad, didn't want anything to do with NATO. He saw it as yet another example of where America is being ripped off overseas. This was not the impression that Biden gave. You know, he, he... had very much the air of a multilateralist. Um, you know, he did come on a mission, but he did come as well seeking to rebuild these alliances. And yesterday, over a couple of hours of talks, um, EU and US leaders agreed to put a halt to the longest running trade dispute at the WTO's history. This was a five year suspension to a Boeing Airbus dispute. So I think from when you look at what Biden's done, he came brandishing a carrot for the European Union. He wanted to offer them something, uh, as I mentioned, a return to multilateralism and an end to this trade dispute. Uh, But what does he want in return? Well, I think he's trying to build a coalition on China. Uh, If you read the language of the US statements following yesterday's summit, then it's clear that this was something Biden was very eager to get to the forefront of the agendas of all of these events. And I think he's, he's done that. You know, he's, he's been successful in doing that. So, Finbar, I wanted to circle back to the G7 a, a, a bit, and we'll talk a little bit more about sort of uh, uh, the EU. But uh, I, I am curious, you know, when we look back at the G7 statement, it says China's stated ambitions and assertive behavior presents systemic challenges to the rules based international order and to areas relevant to alliance security. But then when we saw the U.S. statements and we saw the European statements, they're very different on, in terms of how they spoke about China. And so I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, does, does Biden see this as a win this time around or, you know, will we have to have more coming from Europe down the line? 
I think this, he would see it as a step in the right direction. I don't think that he's finished. I think that certainly he's trying to drag Europe along on this journey with China. Um, this language about system, systemic challenge is percolating through all of the statements. The NATO statement also does this for the first time. Uh, you know, the G7 and uh, the EU-US statement yesterday, the joint statement, now th th that was the same. So they both put out this joint statement, which was fairly, um, you know, fairly standard on China. Uh, don't forget that the EU itself has also designated China as a systemic rival. Um, the EU has this three-pillared approach to China, which is that it is a partner when it needs to be. It is a competitor. And it is also a rival. So this was, was you know, something that you'd already done. But I think, yeah, Biden will think this is a few steps in the right direction. He managed to insert China right at the top of the agenda across the board. There was more language on China than ever before in the G7 statement. Um, interesting to note that Taiwan appeared in the G7 statement for the first time. So for a United States administration pushing China as its absolute foreign policy priority in the face of allies who are not usually as keen to, to go so directly. I think this would be viewed as progress. Um, but we can see from the language, as you mentioned, there were some sort of some, some differences. After the Boeing Airbus dispute had been suspended, both the EU and the US on Tuesday, yesterday, put out their own fact sheets. Now, the US version was, uh, was very heavy on China. It said that essentially why we've saw this dispute is so that we can free up resources and energy to partner against China. This is very different to, to the European Union didn't mention it at all. So you can see that they are on different journeys. As I said at the top of the podcast, the trip went as expected. There were no real catastrophes. Everybody seemed on the same hymn sheet with regard to China, if not as uh, as far along. But I, I do think that Biden would probably think that, you know, this is this is fine for his first overseas trip. You know, in a crowded schedule there, let's move on from the G7 to the EU meeting. And I'm, I'm curious sort of what stood out to you uh, among sort of the thoughts you saw from European leaders uh, following their meeting with uh, Biden. Yeah, I mean, I, again, as, as we, we mentioned, I think we can draw some conclusions as to where they are in their respective journeys with China. After the summit, we had a press conference here in Brussels and Ursula von der Leyen, the, uh, EU, the European Commission president, she came out and gave a list of all the items that, that had been discussed. Uh, she didn't mention China until one of the reporters asked her about it. Um, so the very fact that she didn't put that on her own list, you know, she was running through COVID, climate change, trade, WTO reform, all these all these laundry list of issues um, the EU wanted to discuss with the US, but didn't mention China until she was prompted. It was only then that she mentioned human rights, which tells you perhaps that it's not foremost among her priorities on what the EU and the US should be doing together. Uh, whereas... Um, the U.S. really featured it very heavily. Like if you contrast the various briefings with reporters that they had, uh, Joe Biden, Catherine Tai, his trade representative, they all immediately and voluntarily raised China. They put it in the headlines of their press releases and their fact sheets. Um, you know, the, as I mentioned, the Boeing Airbus uh, release mentioned China seven times. It was subheaded United States and European Union reach agreement to address shared challenges from China. The European Union didn't mention China at all. So you know, this was really interesting to me that the fact that it's telling, you know, this is classic EU. They will, you know, want to, as I mentioned, maintain this three pillared approach. They don't want to necessarily uh, raise, uh, you know, draw too much attention to what they're doing on China. They, they know that it won't go down too well in Beijing. So they would rather sort of fly under the radar as far as that may be possible for an, for, for, for a, a block as large as the European Union. Yeah. And, and I want to circle back to uh, one of your latest stories about the following up on the Biden meeting, uh, it, you know, with the EU, they announced a, a, a new American European Trade and Technology Council. And so I, I'm curious, was this a surprise or, or were people expecting something like this to come out of the meeting? No, this was very much expected. It was telegraphed way in advance. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman was here last month in May, meeting with uh, one of the top European foreign policy officials, Stefano Sanino. Sanino. Um, that was really to get this off the ground. It was something that had been reported. It was something that we had we saw coming. We didn't have too much detail and to be honest, we still don't have a whole pile of detail. Uh, there's a lot of high-level statements in there about what the overarching ambitions of this are and it's sort of grow trade and investment and move trade barriers, share research, 
set the global standards. That, so, so it's a sense of um, in the face of rising competition from China, China dominates a lot of these high-tech sectors, semiconductors and so on, um, the production of them at least. So there's a sense here that they're trying to wrestle back some sort of control of the, of the industries to um, you know make them not so vulnerable to China, less dependent on China so that they can withstand any shocks that may come from being overly, overly exposed to a partner which I guess they consider to be a malevolent force, um, you know, so, so, so it feeds into a lot of what Biden's doing domestically about uh, strengthening supply chains, about, you know, becoming a bit more self-sufficient. That's really the overarching theme here. And it's all wrapped up in this realm of promoting a democratic model of digital governance. That's a quote from the statement. You know, so it's it's, it's essentially about um, trying to reassert some control over these supply chains, which have been lost over the decades to uh, China and to other parts of, of Asia, and building an, an alliance among d- democratic countries to, to, to partner on this. You know, Finbar, it is interesting, g- given how much Beijing has been focused on things like making its own um, semiconductor industry self-sufficient and sort of relying less upon foreign, you know, components and things. So I'm curious in in this kind of situation, what does this mean for sort of the ongoing trade war between the U.S. and China? You know, could we see additional tariff moves or or anything? I I realize there's still a, a lot to figure out to keep, whether it be Trump tariffs or Trump policies, and they're sort of taking their own route on it. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't see that it really affects that at all. Biden has shown a willingness to keep some of those Trump era policies. I mean, while he resolved partially the or temporarily at least, why they resolved the Boeing Airbus dispute, the tariffs on steel and aluminium remain in place. You know, so it's not as though he's come here and, and dropped everything that Trump had. So, so, so you know, I don't necessarily see this being. Um, having any short term or medium term effect on 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 China I think like the US is already the direction of travel is very very clear there there will be more punitive action on China perhaps um further down the line but I, I don't necessarily think that this trade and technology council is going to be the the genesis of that or, or have any effect on that really it's very early days don't forget it's just been just been launched there's no detail to it we don't know how it's been funded we don't know exactly which projects are going to do some people talk about rare earth minerals semiconductors is obviously a huge one but I think it's something for the future and so Finbar I, I'm curious if uh, you're hearing anything from Beijing any kind of reaction from China to this cozying up between the US and Europe now? As you can expect, they weren't too happy with this statement. A couple of statements over the past few days, one from the UK, the Chinese embassy in the UK, uh, another from the Chinese embassy here in Brussels, uh, both basically blaming the United States for trying to poison ties with the rest of the world and China. Uh, we had the Chinese mission to the European Union. I think it was yesterday they came out with quite quite a lengthy statement, again, sort of saying that the US is, is uh, you know, uh, crazy um, that it uh, needs medication. Some of these quite outlandish statements. There was a sense that they were trying to prey on the um, the fact that the European Union is not so far along on its journey with China. Uh, we had some of these. Um, the statement said that it considered the European Union to be um, a, par- a comprehensive partner and not a rival, which is counter to the language, the very language that the European Union uses. As I mentioned earlier, it, it considers and it, you know it has documented the fact that it considers China to be a systemic rival. So I, I think that there was a little bit of um, anxiety on the Chinese side that they do see that Biden's been fairly successful in building this coalition and restoring the transatlantic alliance. So the, the you know this statement spoke to the fact that they maybe see that there's still still a chance to maybe peel off parts of the European Union um, who, who aren't maybe as enamored with this sort of multilateral Biden um, uh, as, as, as you might think. Well, Finbar, that's uh, been great catching up. I appreciate it very much. Thanks for joining us and we look forward to talking to you next week. Thanks, Chad. Thanks for listening to the China Geopolitics Podcast. Don't forget, you can get the latest news and our ongoing analysis and commentary on China and the rest of the world on scmp.com. My name is Chad Bray. Thanks for listening.